I invite you to open to page 7 where you'll find our scripture reading for the day, um, which comes to us from Isaiah chapter 26. This is a prophecy concerning what it will look like when Jesus comes. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter, the nation that keeps faith. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. He humbles those who dwell on high, and he lays the lofty city low. He levels it to the ground and casts it down to dust. Feet trample it down, the feet of the oppressed and the footsteps of the poor. But Lord, you establish peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. Amen. So we're in the middle of a series during Advent where we're talking about peace and we've been talking about a lot of heavy stuff lately, like what is peace and world peace. And today, we're going to get super practical for just a little bit and talk about what it would look like if we actually had peace with our families at Christmas. Some of you are like, all right, that's impossible. That's way harder than world peace. Uh, but that's what we're going to talk about today. This uh, last summer, I was with my family, and I took my wife and my little two-year-old, and we met up with my parents and my brother and sister-in-law and their three-year-old. And when we planned this vacation, it was in Washington State, where both of us are from. And we go there, and my mom and dad had rented this amazing little place. And she has this vision where when the family gathers together, it is the most perfect and harmonious and joyful, wonderful event that will be remembered and treasured throughout all time. Like, that's what my mom's goal is every time she puts together one of these things. And when she does it, she also makes sure that we're in a really tight space so that we interact with one another a lot. And she makes sure that every single moment is scheduled because she wants us to be enjoying one another really hard. And if you try and make your family be happy, what usually happens next? It's a, it's a nightmare. And so it didn't take long before our two little kids were like, we don't like this place. We want to go home. We want to do this. They start fighting with one another. And then everyone says, I'm hungry, but I'm not hungry yet. And so when do our family eat? Ah, I don't know what we're going to do. And then one person wants to go do this. And then one person wants to go do this. And one person's tired. One person wants to stay up. Someone's being too loud. And then someone says something they're not supposed to say. And then it gets worse. And this is still day one. And we have six more days to go after that. And... Uh, it was a brutal trip. At the end of the trip, we were like, guys, we'll see you again in like 10 years, maybe. I don't know. Um, I love you guys, but this is too much. I'm stressed, and I'm exhausted, and I love my family, but at the same time, it's tough sometimes. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about how to make it through Christmas with peace. How to make it through Christmas with peace. And I want you to know that I'm preaching this sermon in front of my in-laws. They're here today, and uh, so if this was an Olympic diving event, this would be like the highest degree of difficulty you could possibly have for a message. Preaching a sermon on peace with your family right before Christmas with your in-laws in the front row. Uh, that's what we're going to try to do today. We've been talking about peace, and the title of this message is, How Do We Have Peace in Our Relationships, or How Do We Get Through Christmas Without Experiencing Hell? Because for a lot of us, times like Christmas are meant to be so happy and yet we experience so much pain. And this is just a little plug. On this coming Thursday, December 21st, we have a special service at 8 p.m. called The Longest Night. And that service is specifically designed for people, often myself included, who are going through a period of pain. And for some people, Christmas is really challenging just because you've lost a loved one or you're out of work or things are just not going well. That's a special service I'd like to invite you to tonight. But at the same time, for those of us that are going to sit around a table during Christmas with a bunch of people that we're supposed to like but often struggle to love, this message is for you. And so today I have eight things that I'd like to share with you that I hope will bring you peace this Christmas. The first one is this, is that if you want to live in peace with your family during Christmas time, the first step that you need to take is to get some alone time. Get some alone time. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Never forget that peace in the world and peace in your family starts with you. It starts with you first. Oftentimes we think that we'll experience peace if and only if all the outside world lines up and is exactly what I need in order to be happy. But the real people that have peace are the people that are able to have a sense of tranquility in the midst of chaos. And that's the goal. We think that when Jesus was going to the cross, 
He was stressed in his human nature, but deep down he had an abiding peace, even when nails were driven into his hands, because he knew that as bad as the world can get, he knew that he had a God who loved him and would take care of him. Peace starts first with you. You know, I'm one of those people who gets frustrated easily. Uh, though you know those Snickers commercials? You're not you when you're hungry. Uh, my, my wife will see me getting upset and angry, and she says, do you just need a Snickers or something, man? Because you're not you right now. And we all know what our triggers are. Those things that, like, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm stressed, things are going wrong. Whenever we're at our moments of weakness, we're not going to be able to respond positively. So if you put me into a situation where I show up to my family party and I am stressed, exhausted, running late, maybe financially strapped, trying to make everything work, wrapping presents at the last minute, I can tell you this, you're not going to have peace. If you're not at peace with yourself, you are never going to have peace in the midst of chaos. I've said this before, but I want to say it again, and this is important at Christmas time. If you're busy, it is impossible to be connected to God. Busyness is often the thing that we promote as in our culture. Whenever you ask someone, hey, how's it going? Oh, man, super busy these days. As if that's like a sign that things are great. And often in the business world it is. But I'd love to meet someone where I say, hey, how are you doing? And they say, you know what? I'm not that busy these days. I'm doing okay. No one says that, right? But I think the reason why we don't say that is because we've lost track of what matters the most. You will never have peace if you're too busy. The most important thing you can do with your life is set out and block out times in your life where you can center yourself and get some peace. Jesus, we know this, that in the most difficult times of his life, it says in the scriptures that he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. If you want peace going into Christmas time, you got to look at your calendar this coming week and say, I need to block off some time just to get me and God right. So what I all do as a pastor sometimes during stressful times, and it can be stressful at church, what I like to do is come here at the times when no one's here, like maybe at night, and I'll just sit in one of these pews and just breathe for a little while. Because if I go into a Sunday service or if I go into a meeting or if I go back home while I'm stressed, I know I'm not going to bring the best parts of me. So the number one thing that I would say if you want to have peace at Christmas is to get some alone time. The second thing is this. Don't fight back. Don't fight back. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says, Make sure that no one pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. You know, when Jesus was here on earth, there were people that picked on him, that asked him questions, that persecuted him, that whipped him, that nailed him to a cross. And every time someone did something, there would be someone that came, would come alongside Jesus and say, Jesus, can't you just, like, fix this right now? Can't you just fight back? And Jesus turns to one of his friends and he says, you know what? I have armies of angels that I could call down at any moment. Why do you think Jesus, in the midst of being fought against, chose not to fight back? Because he knew that if you fight with the same weapons as the person coming at you, that nobody wins. Instead, what Jesus did when people said negative things about him and tried to tear him down and tried to cut him apart, what he would do is he would say, listen, you can't hurt me. I know who I am and I know whose I am and I'm going to be okay. And I don't need to fight with the weapons of this world. Whenever, uh, I, was, whenever I was growing up, uh, when I was growing up, I was one of those kids who had a sharp tongue. I was very good at inciting someone to get a reaction out of them if I wanted them to be upset. So I would go into a family meeting and I would bring up that one thing that is always wrong, right? And we all have those people when we get together that it's like we never fix the problem. We just keep talking about it forever. And when you get into a situation maybe this next week when you're surrounded by people who you have some deep history with, there's going to be a temptation to say things or to fight back when you shouldn't. If you want to have peace, I think the way that you do it is through de-escalating the tensions in our families. It sounds tough and kind of weird, but whenever I get together with my family or with my brother, I remember, it's like, it's like I'm a teenager again, right? So the two of us are in our 30s now, but we still treat each other like we're 14 sometimes. And whenever he says this, and then I say this, and I remind him of that, and he reminds me of this, and I just say, okay, I'm just going to let you win this one. I'm just going to go grab a drink and sit down and relax for a little bit because I don't need to fit, win this fight. If you want peace in your family, one of the most important steps you can take is to realize that in every moment you have the option of de-escalating the tension instead of increasing it. Man, it is so hard though, right? Every part of our heart wants to fight back because we want to win. And we want to be right. And we want to be justified. And we want to make sure that that person ends up doing what they're supposed to do. 
And you can fight that way, and you can probably win, and at the end, even if you win the argument, you'll definitely have lost the relationship. And if you want peace in your family, you have to step down. I'm so impressed by Jesus that he raises up the lowly and he moves down the people that are high because Jesus is interested in the people that are willing to put other people ahead of themselves and not be the one that wins all the time. So get some alone time. But remember not to fight back. Point number three is ask God for help. Ask God for help. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in prayer, ask God for help. And get this, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I remember in some of the most difficult times of my life, you know, the temptation is, is to just be frazzled and stressed, but I remember um, a very couple moments where I didn't know if I was going to make it through the next hour. Instead, what I do is I just take a step back from the whole thing and I say, God, I need you right now. I need help. Some of us know what that's like when you knock on a door of a family member and you're maybe going over to a friend's house and you say, God, I'm about to go through this door and the moment I go through this door, I'm going to be tempted to fight with every single person in the room. But God, I need your help. I really do believe two things about prayer. The first thing about prayer is I believe that it can change the course of events. And so if you pray and ask God that he will make things better in your family, that can happen. It sounds crazy to think about it, but I believe in the power of prayer, and I've seen it work in my life and in the lives of so many other people. But another powerful thing happens in prayer is that it changes you. Whenever we have meetings in a Presbyterian church, this is in our church constitution. We are required, whenever we have an official meeting of the First Miami Presbyterian Church, we have to pray at the beginning of the meeting, and we have to close the meeting in prayer as well. And the reason why we require that is because we believe that when we pray, it changes us. It softens our hearts. It opens our ears to hear God's spirit and our minds to be able to conceive where he wants us to go. And so this is another crazy challenge that I would give you too, is during Christmas time we often have a lot of stress in our life. Do you, do you pray at all? When's the last time you took some time just to spend some time in prayer and say, God, I need your help if I'm going to succeed, if I'm going to have peace on Christmas this year? Uh, one of the coolest things you can do, especially if you're in a relationship with someone else, is when's the last time you prayed with that person? Because prayer isn't always meant to be just a, a solo activity. If you're a married person, one of the most intimate moments you can have with your spouse is to pray together. And so this is going to sound crazy, but, um, you know, and I don't do this enough, but how cool is it when a mom and a dad pray with their child before bed? It changes everything. When a couple, before they go out of their room in the morning and start getting breakfast ready and everything else, they just take 15 seconds, grab the other person's hand and say, God, help us with this day. Sounds cheesy and it sounds almost too easy, but I guarantee you that if you take some time this Christmas to slow down for even 15 seconds and grab someone's hand and pray with them before you go into a stressful situation, it will change things. It's not only the promise of Scripture. But it transcends all understanding and the peace of Christ will come to us. If you want peace this Christmas, ask God for help. The fourth thing I'll share with you, if you want peace in your families this Christmas, is to believe in a better future. Believe in a better future. James 3.18 says, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Did you know that when you go to a family reunion or a Christmas party, you can actually make peace in that situation? You have the power in that moment to make decisions that can actually make things better for you and for every single person in that room. One of the things that scares me is the statistics that show me that if you come from divorced parents, you have a 50 to 60% chance, more likely chance, to get a divorce yourself as well. Studies show that if you have alcoholic parents, you're at a higher risk of being an alcoholic yourself. And we know what it's like when you show up to a family thing and all the same problems, and all the same cycles, and all the same patterns, and family systems come into play. And it's like you're involved in this trap that never stops. But I want to challenge you this Christmas, because this is one of the things I firmly believe, is that every single one of you, when you go into your family this weekend, you have an opportunity to bring peace. You have an opportunity to change the history of events in your family. So I've seen this happen before. I have a friend who... Um, 
their family wasn't Christian at all, and they didn't know Christ, and they'd kind of just been dealing with all kinds of stuff. There was abuse in their family, physical abuse. There was alcoholism and drug abuse. And whenever this family would get together, it was just a disaster. But my friend, um, he was at a camp with me one time, and both of us at the same time gave our lives to Christ. And one of the things that he told me when I met with him a year later is he said, you know what, Chris? My presence now when I'm with my family, I see myself as someone who's bringing peace and goodness into that broken place. I have a friend here at the church who was um, telling me a story of how whenever his parents come to visit, man, he hates it. And he actually used the phrase that when his parents come to visit, and she feels the same way, whenever the parents come to visit, it's almost better if the parents don't come. It creates so much stress and so much tension, and you almost get to a place when you hate your parents, right? I don't know if you're in that situation, but I know a lot of people are. And as we were walking along, one of the things that he said to me is he said, you know what? Man, I hate, I hate it when they come, and I don't know how to deal with this. But he has a little son, and one of the things that he said was, I really hope that my son doesn't say that about me. That's heavy. What if he has the potential to change his family forever? I believe that when you go into your families this weekend, you have the ability to build peace in that family and to set it free. It's a cool opportunity to think about that. But I truly do believe that this weekend, you'll have opportunities to build peace in your relationships in a powerful way. The fifth thing I'll share with you is this. Set boundaries. Set boundaries. Romans 12, 18 says this. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So God says, live at peace with everyone. But I understand there's some people. But I understand there's some people. If you know that your family will lead you to do or say something destructive, then maybe you need to consider limiting your time with them. I have friends who, uh, whenever I'm with them, they almost like, I get into more trouble than I should, or I drink more than I should, or I say things that maybe I shouldn't be saying. And it's like, there's people, when we bring them into our lives, they cause us more pain than help. And as much as we're called to be peacemakers, we do have to recognize that we do have limits. Whenever we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, God, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. And if there are people who lead you into temptation, you need to consider setting important boundaries with those folks. One of my favorite little phrases that I heard from another pastor is this. He says, hurt people, hurt people, and free people, free people. Hurt people, hurt people, but free people, free people. There are people whose lives are full of so much pain inside, whenever you're around them, they almost try to make you feel their pain, and they try and ruin everyone else's life too. And we all know what those people are like, and I've done that myself to other people. When I'm in a bad moment and I'm not doing well and I'm hurt, I bring my pain to everyone. I get angry with my wife, I snap like that, or I'll be frustrated with my daughter, or I'll say things I don't want to say. And whenever I'm in a hurt place when I'm not doing well, I inflict that pain on all kinds of other people. But when I'm free, when I experience God's grace and my batteries are charged and I'm going into a situation where I have peace inside, you know what I do? I free people too. They might be hurt, but I can change their life because I know what God's done for me. So you have the opportunity to bring change into your family. Hurt people, hurt people, and free people, free people. But you also have to be smart, and I recognize that sometimes there are some people who are going to bring you so far down that you need to set a boundary with them. And I want you to know that that's okay. I know I have a friend that says, we're going to go there and arrive at 1, and we are leaving that house at 2.15, no matter what, right? Uh, and if you feel like that's what you need in order to have peace, I just want to encourage you and say that's okay. Because even though God calls us to amazing things, he also knows our limits and works with us where we are. The sixth thing I want to share with you for this Christmas, if you want peace in your family, is watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. 1 Peter 3.10 says, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Colossians 4.6 says, Let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. In the letter of James in the New Testament, he describes our tongues as the rudder on a ship. He says, like, you know, wherever your tongue goes, that's how things go out there because it's what guides everything. Once you say something and the words come out of your mouth, you can't get them back, right? You try and, like, pull them back, but once they're in the air, they're in the air. And I've seen more damage and harm caused in families and in relationships by words than by almost anything else. 
So my challenge to you, this congreg- to, to you, the congregation today, is as you go into the Christmas season, be very careful how you use your words. Be very careful how you use your words. You want to be authentic and you want to be real and say what's on your heart, but you have the opportunity to say that in a way that is painful and destructive or a way that is constructive and helpful. Like I said before, I was always one of those people that knew how to use my words to hurt people. But the older I get, the more I pray, God, I hope that you can use every email that I write, every message that I speak, every conversation I have in a hallway, even every text I send on my phone to bring peace into the world. Your mouth is powerful. You have the opportunity to do so much with it, and I hope this Christmas that you can do good. Number seven, be gentle. Be gentle. Philippians 4, 5 says, Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. And Proverbs 15, 1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Uh, This is a hard thing for me because we're in the middle of potty training at my house. Um, It's like terrible. I I don't know. Amazingly, all adults have been through this, but I don't remember how it happened for me. But I know how it's happening for my little one. She's two or so, and we have another baby coming in a few months, and so we decide we got to knock this out. We're going to do this right now. And uh, all right, so there was this moment yesterday where our daughter, we know she has to go. She's been holding it for five hours like a camel. And we've been like pumping liquids into her with IVs saying, all right, we're going to make this happen. If you're not going to go, we're going to give you water until you have to go. And it's been five hours. And it gets to the point where she's like, just like, she can't even stand. Her eyes are crossed. She's got to go so bad and we know it. And we have her little potty over there and we're like, Grace, you can do this. You can do this. And she won't do it. She won't do it. She won't do it. And it's starting to get tough. Finally, my wife, who's a lot stronger than me, she grabs Grace and, and we take her into the bathroom ourselves. And I'm, I have an option at this moment. I go, you know what? Good job, Jen. You go that way. You know, while you go deal with her, I'm just going to hang out over here. But I go, no, Lord, I can do this. And I go, Jen, why don't I just hang out with you? So I just sat in the room while Jen was trying to like physically hold her down to try to get her to go. And we're like struggling and struggling and struggling. And it gets like the daughter screaming. My wife is like losing all of her patience whatsoever. And there's a part of me that's like, stop, I can't take this anymore. You know, like I'm freaking out and I don't know what to do. And I remember this text and I said, you know what? Hey, Jen, it's okay. Is there anything I can do to help? You know, and me just being there, being gentle, being soft, was able to take a moment that could have been so terrible and painful and make it okay. So it sounds silly, the word gentleness, right? We don't use it very often in our culture. And we don't ever talk about gentleness as a virtue. But did you know that the Bible describes people that are gentle as being having one of the fruits of the Spirit? If the Holy Spirit is in you, then you're a gentle person. So the more harsh you are, the more tough you are, the more rough you are, the less like you are God. So my challenge to you this Christmas is in moments of difficulty, remember to be gentle. You could say it one way, but you could also do it a different way. The last thing I want to share with you today, if you want to have peace with your family, is to love them always. Is to love them always. Colossians 3.12 says, As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You know, one of the things that helps me, and this is going to sound weird, um, you know, they say if you're a public speaker, you're supposed to picture everyone naked and then you'll be comfortable. I don't know if that works, and I'm not doing that right now, just so you know. Uh, I actually think that would be really weird for me, so I don't do that at all. Um, But, you know, when I'm around a table of people that are arguing or that I'm frustrated with or I want to fight or I'm angry with, one of the things that helps me is just to remember that they're just as hurt and broken people as you are. The kind of person that you're most angry at, at the end of the day, is a broken sinner who needs God, who needs love, who needs grace as much as anybody else. And then we sit around a table full of people. You know, it's, it's interesting. We usually fight way more with the people close to us than the people that are far away. Why? Because we actually love them and care. The people I don't care about, they'll say something to me. I'll be like, all right, well, this is the last time I'll ever see you. Bye, right? But family's different. Family you're stuck with a little bit more at, at its best. And one of the things that helps me in the midst of having difficult family times is just to remember that they're not perfect. In the same way, I'm not perfect. And we expect so much from the people around us. We expect them to always give us what we want. We expect them to always do what's nice for us. You know, and part of what the gospel shows us is that all of us stand on an equal playing field in need of forgiveness and grace. 
And so this Christmas, don't forget that. Don't walk in there and think that your kids are supposed to be like the ideal children that never do anything wrong. Or that your spouse has infinite energy and courage and strength and can do everything you need. Or that your parents are the perfect people. You know, one of the things that is the most freeing thing you can ever, I think, realize is the people that cause you the most pain in your life are actually there for a reason. They've helped make you who God wants you to be. When you realize that, you don't see them as problems. You see them as just people who God loves and you're called to love them too. So do you think there's a chance maybe this Christmas you could have peace? Well, that's my prayer. I believe that God offers us that opportunity this very week. And no matter what stress comes your way, even as I hear children fighting during this service, right? There's peace. I think God can come even in the midst of chaos to give us what we so desperately crave. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that even in crazy times, your offer of peace still stands. Help us to be peacemakers. Help us to get time alone. Help us to watch our mouths and to be gentle. Help us to get some alone time this week and to remember that we need to get our batteries charged. Help us not to fight back and to remember that we can ask you for help. But God, we believe in a better future for our families and for ourselves. And we ask that you would help us in the midst of difficult times. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.